starting us off at number 10 is The Couple. Now back in 2016, Charlie Carver and his girlfriend Kala, Kayla, not really sure, but Kayla Brown had just moved in together in Anderson, South Carolina. On the 31st of August, they had dinner plans with friends but never ended up showing up. Security footage showed Charlie going to work but neither of them leaving the house to go to dinner. After a few days of absolutely no one hearing from them, their parents called the police. The couple's car wasn't there but their door was unlocked, their medicines were at home and Kayla's glasses were there too. I'm gonna say Kayla, I hope it's not Carla. I'm sorry if I got it wrong. Even their dog was roaming the house without food or water, so something was definitely wrong. Two months passed, and there was still no word until Charlie posted something on Facebook saying him and Kayla were married now and that they were fine. A few hours later, the post was deleted. This was weird since Charlie barely ever used Facebook to begin with, so why would he randomly just say that and start using it now? Then even weirder stuff started being posted on his page like a missing poster for the couple. On another post, a friend commented asking where the hell is Kayla Brown, to which his account responded, Kayla is with her husband Charlie. The odd posts and the third person self reference implied it wasn't Charlie behind the account, even though it was even messaging his friends saying I'm just missing to everyone else, we are both okay. So the couple's friends and family have no idea where they are, if the account has been hacked or not, or what the hell is going on. Charlie is a mystery, so is Kayla. Kala. Brown. I hope they're okay. But I've been watching a lot of forensic files, so I'm pretty sure they're murdered somewhere. I'm not trying to be morbid, it's just the truth. Coming in at number nine is the kidnapping. Now, this one blew my mind because of the sheer stupidity of this man. Like, I didn't realize this level of low intelligence was out there, but clearly it is. Eamon Savage moments. Anyway, back in 2011, a man called Jason Valdez kidnapped a woman and held her hostage in a hotel room in Utah for 16 hours, which isn't ideal by any means, but what makes it worse is that he live blogged the entire thing on Facebook through his statuses. Like, I don't get it. If you're gonna kidnap someone, why are you sharing it so publicly for the world to see and for the police to be able to track your location because you're posting from your phone? Like, oh no, baby, what is you doing? The status updates were later deleted, as was his account. Otherwise, I would have loved reading them out for you guys, but yeah. I mean, I'm not quite sure what possessed him to do that. Like, why would you kidnap someone? Why would you post about it? But okay, Jason, you continue making your bad decisions from jail. At number eight, we have Alexander Nikolov. Now, this Facebook account was probably the biggest scam of last year. Alexander Martinez was the victim of one of the worst cases of identity theft on Facebook ever. His name, info, and pictures were used to create various accounts, including a Facebook profile under the name Alexander Nikolov. The person running his account was Spaz Vasilov, who lived a secluded life in Bulgaria. He followed Alex on all his private social media accounts, so Spaz would download his pictures and fake a life on Facebook. The glamorous life showed him getting jobs at huge multinationals. It'd say he lived in Paris and then New York with his wife and kids, who, by the way, were not real. The account looked so legit that it garnered quite a big media following, including journalists, politicians, and other public figures. For two years the scam went on, fake Alex managed to get huge sums of money from different people who thought he was real. He would even promise people discounted flights and would take their money and actually get the flights, but very last minute and not cheaply by any means. The account is now offline and Alexander had no effing clue anyone was using his pictures for any purpose and it blew his mind. Filling our number 7 slot is the marriage. So back in 2015, an Indian man called Rahul Madhyani was befriended by the account of a woman called Richa Sajnani. They started talking on Facebook regularly and she basically manipulated him into falling in love with her. Two years later, Rahul asked to meet her and obviously she said yes but never actually showed up. Catfish alert. Either way, a year later, Rahul got engaged to someone else called Sneha Chopra, but soon after their engagement, they found a fake profile of him on Facebook. The profile was full of Photoshop pictures of Rahul and Richa as a married couple, and as time went on, more pictures started popping up. Some with Rahul's relatives, some explicit ones of Rahul and Richa, and his personal info was leaked everywhere. So many pictures were uploaded that Sneha's family had had enough and actually called the wedding off. 
off completely. Moral of the story, you guys, if you've been chatting to a girl on Facebook for two years and haven't met her, chances are she's high key not real. Sorry to burst your bubble. Now at number six is dead again. So last year, the Facebook account of jazz musician Mirza Kupalija was deleted two years after his death. His wife Azra was so distraught over the sudden deletion since she never requested for his profile to be deleted and neither did any family member. She was so distraught because his account had their messages spanning back years, it had pictures of them and relatives on various holidays over the years, she felt like it was like he died all over again. Azra was in conversation with Facebook about the incident for a year before taking legal action. A British judge ordered Facebook to tell them who requested for the profile to be deleted but they refused to tell them. So friends and family ruled out, we have no idea who decided to suspiciously request for Mirza's account to be deleted and why. And I really empathize with this one, I'm such a nostalgic sucker, like I love looking at old photos and reading old conversations, so to have all that erased with someone I love and who's no longer with us, like that's just horrible. Coming in at number 5 is Jaden K. Smith. So back in 2017, the account Jaden K. Smith went on an adding spree and basically just added a bunch of people that had no idea who the hell he was, but accepted anyway because apparently we all like accepting people we don't know when we're like 13 years old because having a thousand Facebook friends is just cool. Not. Don't accept people you don't know, you guys. Hello. But actually, funnily enough, it was more middle aged people accepting him, not the youngins, so good job there, you guys. Either way, as soon as he was accepted, he would start sending messages to people that ended up being a major scam, but people bought into it. But then fear spread as people started freaking out about Jaden hacking their laptops and whatnot, even though Facebook ensured people that simply being friends with someone isn't enough for them to somehow hack into your device. Either way, Jaden sent everyone into a frenzy, because I mean, he may not be able to hack into your device but he can still make you click on a virus link and screw you over that way. More experienced Facebook users started tweeting about the incident and it was actually quite funny. One was from Irish Kangaroo who said, I don't know who Jaden K. Smith is on Facebook but he sent every middle aged friend I have into social overdrive and I lolled my ass off. They never got to the bottom of it though or found out who Jaden was but odds are he was probably some bored computer whiz who wanted to mess with a bunch of people and he damn well succeeded. At number 4 is the poet. Now this is like a Shakespearean story of one gone very wrong. The account of a woman called Tota Bala Thako went viral back in the day because of her posts being increasingly violent. She even admitted on Facebook that she killed her husband Shimendra Thako because she was in love with someone else. Which I don't understand at all, like you're the one in love with someone else, either get a divorce or run off with that person, you don't have to kill him because he's not your vibe anymore, like come on. After a while a poet by the name of Umber Pandey came out claiming he was the one handling Tota's profile and people had even speculated a guy was behind her account because of how violent her posts were. But the stark difference in writing styles of both individuals made people suspicious that he was lying. And years later, we still don't know who the hell this woman is, if she's real or not, if she did in fact kill her husband or not. Like this murderer could have very well confessed on Facebook and we're all out here sending Farmville requests to everyone else. Just kidding, it's not 2010, we do not play Farmville anymore people. But I was ace at it just to let you know. Hashtag killed it. Filling our number three slot is Alex Sigley. So Alec is one of many students who went missing in North Korea. He moved there to get a master's degree in Korean literature and also ran a small tour company. And despite living in the heavily censored country, he was unusually active on social media. He'd post photos on Facebook all the time and update his blog about his activities. So really, he was on it. He went missing in July of this year, and his family decided to take down his Facebook account just to prevent any unnecessary speculation online, but a few nights later his account reappeared and no one had any idea who reinstated it and why. A few hours later his account disappeared again which was just odd since no one actually had his password, so how did it suddenly reappear and then disappear again? Turns out he was being held in detention after being arrested for reasons that remain undisclosed. One article said North Korean officials believed he was a spy as he was the only Australian living in North Korea at the time, but who really knows? Glad you're safe, Alec. Now at number two is Prince Harry. So unless celebrities are on social media using their real names, I feel like a lot of them actually use these sites anonymously under different names. And the Facebook account of Spike Wells is one of them. The account has 400 friends, most of which are Britain's richest young elite, and the person also parties and travels a sh 
ton. I'd love to be Spike right about now. Either way, back in 2012, many people believed the account belonged to Prince Harry, whose nickname is Spike, and even his Scotland Yard minder calls him that as well. After a bunch of naked pictures of Prince Harry in Vegas were uploaded, his advisors told him to delete his Facebook page, and coincidentally, Spike Wells's page disappeared around the same time. When he went to Vegas, Spike changed his profile picture to three guys wearing matching Panama hats, and one of them looked very much like Prince Harry. They were also standing in a huge hotel suite, which looked a lot like the MGM Grand, where Prince Harry was staying at the time. And the profile also said that Spike was from Mourn in Botswana, which is a place he visited with his ex, so I mean, the clues are there. But who is the mystery account? Is it Prince Harry, our lord and saviour, or is it just a random dude from Mourn? Who knows? And finally, at number one is Ori Chef. Back in 2017, the Facebook account of a woman called Ori Chef garnered a lot of attention. The woman had quite a few friends on her list, but they were all different versions of her own account. There were hundreds of accounts of just her under different names like Rory, Marjorie Chef, Marge, Marjorie Sai, but the most common one was Ori Chef. Identical pictures were used for most of the accounts, but for the most part, they were different pictures of the same woman. She'd make weird posts about wanting to be cremated before her husband and to spread her ashes in a body of water or beach because her family enjoyed spending time there. All right. Now the post that originally called her out said most of the accounts of hers last posted a few years ago, but one of them made posts about wanting to harm her own child, but it never said which account it was. Someone actually ended up messaging her about the whole thing and she replied saying she had rented out a computer and made all the accounts and then forgot to log out of them and when she gave the computer back. I still don't understand how that explains anything, but sure, like why did you create like a hundred accounts? You could just create one. Either way, if she's claiming she was hacked, fair enough, but why make all these accounts to begin with? Like, somebody explain, I don't get it. At number 10, by rolling in the dough, we have the bank robbers. Obviously robbing a bank is amongst one of the most stupid things you could ever do, but to get away with it takes brains and strategy. It turns out that John Mogan and Ashley Dubo were lacking a few brain cells when they posted images of themselves with wads of cash on Facebook. Curious, right? Mogan robbed a branch of the savings bank in Asheville near Columbus, Ohio. After the images were posted, they caught the eye of officials who did some research and discovered that Morgan didn't have a full-time job. So where's the money coming from? They did some sleuthing, and along with the Facebook post, they were able to connect him and his girlfriend to the crime. Do the crime, do the time, and they did. Coming in at number nine, we have the beach. I mean, if you're running from the law, I guess be careful about whose friend requests you accept on Facebook, right? 26-year-old American Maxi Sopo, originally from Cameroon, defrauded $200,000 in Seattle and successfully fled the country to relocate to Cancun in Mexico. They didn't let anyone know they were there, but they were found. That kind of money would go a long way in Mexico, so Sopo was kind of living a bit of a baller life and bragging about it on Facebook. What an idiot. I guess that he thought that it was cool to update his Facebook status, along with living in paradise and loving it, because maybe he thought he had like stringent security settings and people wouldn't know exactly where he was, just that he was bawling. Unfortunately, he inadvertently accepted a Justice Department official to his list of Facebook friends. Fool. His Facebook updates never said exactly where he was, but the eagle eye investigator was able to figure it out from the background of his posts. Long story short, they caught him. He spent 33 months in prison. More serious at number 8, we have the missing teenager. In December 2015, a Facebook page called Grateful Doe was used to identify an unidentified dead male who had been run off the road in 1995. A post of images of the man, including a restoration of his look, was made for Facebook with the caption, Do you know me? Died in a car accident on June 26, 1995, estimated 16 to 25 years old, 5 foot 8 inches, 169 pounds, star tattoo on the upper arm, and blonde hair dyed red. It seems that he was killed in a hit and run in Virginia, and the internet decided to try and close this case. The post was shared, and eventually he was identified as missing 19 year old teenager Jason Callahan. Jason was never reported missing as his mother thought that he'd left home. One of the admin for Grateful Joe wrote, I've been sitting here for how long in shock for the sadness for him and his family, but also for the fact that here on Facebook we're making a difference. Because of everyone here, this man was finally able to make his way home. Albeit dead, but still at least his mother had some closure. 
power of Facebook. Coming into number seven, we have a Facebook Live stabbing. In 2019, a man in the Three Rivers area of Quebec was stabbed whilst live streaming at his home when a friend came in and, you know, didn't know that he was broadcasting though, and it seems that a viewer alerted the police and immediately an arrest was made very quickly as a result. The Facebook stream will now be used as evidence in court, however, the charge has not yet been made. Coming into number six, we have the solver of this 37 year old mystery. Okay, so this is actually quite a long one, but I'll do my very best to summarize it for you for this video. But there is once again a link in the description box for all of you interested in learning a little bit more about this and our other sources. So basically, Back in 1978, the bodies of 25 year old Chris and 24 year old Penny Frampton were found in Guatemala. The pair were travelling from the United Kingdom and were childhood sweethearts who were murdered. It seems that they were driven off on a boat by an American, Silas Boston, and they never returned. To cut a very long story short, Chris's sister Penny and her family suspected Boston all along, but the police report of the man said that he'd moved back to California and he'd never been charged, and it was very difficult to pin a crime on someone in the 1970s when there wasn't a lot of information. Also in the 1970s the death in Guatemala wasn't easy in terms of getting information back to Britain where he was from. Recently though in 2018, Penny decided to search for Silas Boston on Facebook and she found him. She just couldn't let it lie, she wanted to search. The case had been long cold but she did some sleuthing for herself. Penny then contacted the Sacramento police who had reopened a case into Boston's missing third wife. Now it seems that Penny was actually able to get in touch with Boston's sons, and an image of the then boys, his sons, with her brother on their dad's ship emerged. The sons came forward to say that they knew that their father had killed the two young British tourists. It turns out that Boston had also killed two more tourists as well. It seems that police were able to track him down and arrest him. The story is a lot longer and more dramatic, but those are the highlights for you. Facebook wins. The right to remain silent applies to you, but not to your smartphone, and that is coming into number five. Facebook is landing a lot of people in jail, and honestly a lot of people are on the fence about it. It seems that in the United States, police officers have a right to collect cell phone data without having a warrant. You don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy on Facebook or your Facebook messages. Police are able to read private Facebook messages and go through Facebook search history data. Some people are okay with this, other people consider this a violation. Whatever your opinion, it has been used to solve crimes and convict criminals. On the other hand though, some people post stupid things on Facebook and don't realise that actually their joke threats or idle threats are being taken seriously and then police officers show up at their door all from a silly Facebook post. People are ending up in court. I don't know, what do you think to that? Can you joke on Facebook or should be people be joking about serious things like that? Let me know your thoughts. Okay, this one is very bittersweet and then bitter again. Justice hasn't been served here. Coming into number four, we have the case of Carolee Ashby. In 1968, there was no Facebook, no crowdsourcing of information, just a team of police officers who were working with physical paper files and lower quality identification technology in order to try and find their evidence. 1968 was the year that a four year old girl died on Halloween as a result of a brutal hit and run in upstate New York. At the time, police did what they could, but the case went cold. Fast forward four decades, and one of the former police officers on the case, the now retired Lieutenant Russ Johnson, posted the story on Facebook saying that he regretted never finding her killer. The story was shared on Facebook, and then shared again, and then shared some more, and it seems it reached a woman all of the way in Florida. This woman had a friend who was scarred for life after she was the passenger in a car that hit a child on Halloween in New York in the 1960s. It was discovered that the man driving was Douglas Parkhurst who was 17 at the time. Now the passenger carried guilt with her her whole life, but never turned the man in. After this tip off from Facebook, police then went in to question him, and he even admitted to the crime. Sadly though, the statute of limitations had passed and he couldn't be arrested for the girl's death. Ooh, this is a juicy one at number three. We have Facebook finding a member of the Mafia and bringing them to justice. The Mafia! The Mafia is an organised crime ring originating from Sicily, but famously has terrorised the United States, Italy and beyond. Recently, a Mafia hitman who called himself, I quote, Scarface, was arrested for being tracked down via Facebook. Pasquale Manfredi was on Italy's 100 most wanted list and had been on the run for a year. Officers were tipped off that Scarface was using Facebook and logged in every now and then to keep up with his friends and kill lists. Great. 
To try and keep his disguise, he would log in using the name of Georgie, and it's believed that he would receive coded messages via the Facebook Messenger app, which basically contained the list of people he needed to kill next. Using top range surveillance, eventually his IP address was secured and he was tracked down to an apartment in southern Italy. When Scarface was caught and arrested, his laptop was then seized and his Facebook scoured for other mafia links. An officer on the case said, Manfredi is a good catch. He is particularly cold and cruel. We tracked him down because we had information that he was using a key to log onto the internet and in particular use Facebook. Justice served. Coming into number two, we have the blogger who helped solve the Steubenville abuse case. In March 2019, a 45 year old crime blogger created fake Facebook and Instagram accounts to do some online sleuthing around a rape case in her former hometown. Alexandria Goddard had read a viral article online about the case, which really was a hot topic at the time. Alexandria said, I used to live in Steubenville, where the high school football players were treated like NFL players, and this actually did seem to be the case with Trent Mays and Malik Richmond, the teenagers that raped Jane Doe. She's a victim whose anonymity is protected, but known by many in the town. Alexandria said, I thought that there was a lot more to this story and that the local media was probably not giving it the coverage that it needed because it was the football team. She said, I went to the football team website, I pulled up the team roster and started going through social media. Alexandria was able to follow the boys online and she uncovered a string of incriminating evidence. Alexandria then used Facebook, Twitter and YouTube to expose the boys who had posted smoking gun evidence of the attack to their friends. Disgusting. The boys were arrested and charged, and justice thanks to one blogger who was paying attention when the town looked the other way. Finally, coming into number one, Facebook was used to solve the murder case of Brittany Gargle. Back in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in 2018, 18 year old Brittany Gargle was found strangled to death. A chunky black belt was found near her body and criminologists suspected that it could have been the murder weapon. It turns out that the case of who killed the teen was solved when Cheyenne Rose Antoine posted an image to Facebook which police say was instrumental in solving the crime. The image was of Gargle with Antoine and Antoine was wearing none other than the black chunky belt found near the body. The image was posted hours before the teen's death. Now it seemed that the killer had tried to throw police off the scent by posting her own Facebook messages asking where her missing friend was. She had killed her. After the image linked her and the belt found at the scene of the crime to the death, Antoine pleaded guilty to manslaughter, saying that she and Gargle had gotten into a drunken argument. She was sentenced to seven years in prison, which to me, like seven years for a murder that was provably you? I'm kind of shocked, but there we go. I guess at least she served time. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the messenger scans. In April 2018, Bloomberg reported that Facebook scans every link and image that you send to your your friends and family on Facebook Messenger. Facebook said they do this so that they can flag content that goes against their terms and conditions. In a statement, they gave an example of their scanning as a tool to detect and stop child exploitation imagery as their system will scan it and then flag it to their attention. Now they say the same works for links that people send you being scanned for malware or viruses. This may sound good on paper, but in practice, many people are unhappy with the idea of Facebook literally scanning every picture or personal link that they send, whether or not it's a machine doing it. At the end of the day, I think this one comes down to, like so many things, how much you value safety and fighting crime compared to your own privacy. I'd be interested to hear where the line is for you in the comments section. Next up at number 9 now, we have deleted videos. In the last video, we talked about Cambridge Analytica, the company that gathered information about millions of Facebook users to sell it on for political purposes. One of Facebook's responses to the scandal was to allow people to download their own data and see for themselves what Facebook has been storing about them. To people's horror, they found that Facebook had stored videos that they had deleted. They were still present in Facebook's archives and available for anyone to retrieve if they knew how. Facebook 
apologise for the unintentional bug, however the damage was kind of already done and public opinion of Facebook plummeted thanks to their very loose definition of the term deleted. Moving on to number 8 now, we have Mark's messages. As many of you are aware, Facebook users can't delete messages from someone else's inbox once they send them a message. They can delete their own all they want, but the other person will always be able to see it. Well, apparently that doesn't apply to Mark Zuckerberg. In early 2018, a TechCrunch report claimed that Facebook reviews old messages sent between sources and Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook. They found that Mark's messages have been removed somehow. When the report was released, Facebook said it was a corporate security measure. Now they claim that after after Sony Pictures had their emails hacked in 2014, they themselves made a number of changes to protect their executive communications. This included, in their words, limiting the retention period for Mark's messages in Messenger. We did so in full compliance with our legal obligations to preserve messages. Now, whether or not you think it's fair that this privilege isn't extended to other Facebook users, one question still remains. Why didn't Facebook publicly disclose this? Moving on to number 7 now, we have the Facebook Facebook killer. Now nobody will say this one is Facebook's fault, but it's still something I think they would like to downplay. On April 16th, 2017, 74 year old Robert Godwin Sr. was shot and killed while walking on a sidewalk in Cleveland, USA. The suspect was 37 year old Steve Stevens. He posted a video of the shooting onto his Facebook account. This led many media outlets to dub him the Facebook killer. Now while this was obviously not Facebook's fault, they did get some criticism. Some people felt that the video should not have even been allowed up on Steven's Facebook page for the two hours that it was there before being taken down. A few weeks later, Facebook announced that it was adding additional personnel to their team to proactively screen Facebook live content for violent and other inappropriate sources. Moving on to number 6 now, we have Russia. Just calling this one Russia. Most people are aware of the ongoing investigation into Russian meddling into the 2016 US election. There has been mounting evidence of a Russian influence campaign on Facebook that targeted American voters to intentionally spread misinformation. Many people claim that Facebook didn't do enough to stop this, despite it happening before their very eyes. In response to this, Facebook announced plans to begin requiring disclosures and disclaimers on all political ads and include issue based ads. Some say that it is a step in the right direction, others say it's way too little too late. Coming in at number 5 now we have anti-semitism. In September 2017, ProRepublica published an article in which they claim that Facebook allowed them to post anti-semitic advertisements with no restrictions. This was all part of a test they did to see if they could even do it. For $30 they promoted 3 posts to over 2,000 people interested in topics that involved extremely anti-semitic phrases. In just 15 minutes the ads were 100% approved. After they contacted Facebook about this, the company removed the anti-Semitic categories which were created by an algorithm rather than people. Despite the fact that the categories and posts were machine made and monitored, that didn't get Facebook off the hook. They admitted fault and said it would explore ways to fix the problem, including limiting the number of categories available or scrutinizing them before they are displayed to buyers. Moving on to number 4 now, we have the Instagram clash. In case you didn't already know, Facebook owns Instagram. They bought the company back in 2012 for $1 billion. In the years since then, many people thought that the two companies had quite a harmonious relationship. However, behind the scenes it was a very different story. Rumours of a rift between them were confirmed in September 2018 when Instagram co-founders Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger announced they would be leaving the company. This was amid reports that their departure might be due to an increase in meddling by Mark Zuckerberg. That is right. They they felt that Mr. Zuckerberg was getting far too involved with their company to the point where they felt the only option was to leave. Now officially they said they were leaving to explore their curiosity and creativity again. Experts think they were trying to run Instagram more independently than Facebook would have liked them to. The companies had worked together well for the past 6 years but it's thought that something happened behind the scenes in the last few months that caused this rift between them. Next up number 3 now we have hate speech. In April 2018. Vox published
published an interview with Mark Zuckerberg which got him into hot water with a lot of people. He said he had helped to silence anti-Rohingya propaganda through the Facebook Messenger scans that we talked about before. That crisis involved 650,000 Rohingya refugees being forced to flee Bangladesh following persecution. Organizers in Myanmar were furious about Zuckerberg's claim. Six groups there signed a letter to Zuckerberg that stated, though these dangerous messages were deliberately pushed to large numbers of people, many people who received them say they did not personally know the sender. Your team did not seem to have picked up on the pattern. For all of your data, it would seem that it was our own personal connection with senior members of the team which led to the issue being dealt with. Mark Zuckerberg might have felt Facebook did enough to stop this hate speech, but many people who were on the ground there did not. Moving on to number two now, we have plagiarism. In 2009, Facebook settled a lawsuit from a man who claimed that he basically came up with Facebook. Let me explain. The lawsuit came from Aaron Greenspan. He attended Harvard University at the same time as Mark Zuckerberg. He designed a program called House System for students and faculty members. One section of that involved a course scheduler, student student marketplace, email service, automatic birthday reminder, message boards, photo albums, digital flyer advertising, an event calendar, map integration, job placement, and local business reviews. Its name was, wait for it, the Universal Facebook, or just Facebook for short. The lawsuit was finally settled with Mark Zuckerberg acknowledging Aaron Greenspawn for his contribution to Facebook. Any money that changed hands over this was not disclosed though. What do you guys think? Is this just inspiration or a total ripoff? And finally at number one now we have experimentation. This is a really shady one that not many people know about. Back in 2012, for about a week, Facebook ran an experiment. Without users' knowledge or permission, many people were shown happier or more more negative statuses than usual, with the opposing ones being censored to them. At the end of the week, Facebook analysts examined if this affected people's moods by seeing if they posted happier or more negative things themselves. Now naturally, there was an absolute uproar when this happened. Many people said this was extremely unethical, and that just because an experiment is done online, it doesn't mean you can hide it from the people taking part. Facebook didn't really seem to mind though, at least not at the time. People speculate that they were trying to find out how to make you happy or sad so that they could advertise certain products to you when they had you in the right mood. And, and I was human. I am human. But I was just referring to myself in the past. Um, not that I was not human. Starting us off in at number 10, let's start from where Facebook began. Let's start off talking about the logo. The reason why Facebook is blue is because Mark Zuckerberg, the creator of Facebook, is colorblind and he can only see blue the best. The logo has changed slightly over time, but the color has always remained the same. Also, Facebook wasn't actually the original name for the site. Mark Zuckerberg first named the site FaceMash, and from there it became TheFacebook.com, but shortly after that, The was dropped, making it Facebook. And at number 9, Facebook causes 1 out of 5 divorces. That's, this sucks. Why Facebook? Why? Well, it's not Facebook, it's the people on it that's being stupid. So Facebook has quickly come more than just like hanging out with your friends or talking to family members. It's become like this online dating thing. People meet each other on Facebook and they talk to each other and they flirt. And a lot of these people are not single. So a lot of times people get bored and they're getting themselves into a lot of trouble by talking to people that they shouldn't. A lot of these times their partner finds out because these people would be posting pictures with someone they shouldn't be and put them on Facebook. I mean, why are you guys not smart cheaters? You guys get caught by that? I'm not say that cheating is good but at least be a little bit better at it you're hanging out with the girl and your wife checks your Facebook account every day probably not the best idea I'm just saying in a number eight let's talk about how often we use Facebook. oh wait sorry I just gotta check my Facebook update Oh, sorry, let's talk about how often we, me, us, we use Facebook, because we use it quite often. Every morning when people wake up, about 48% of people aged 18 to 34 years old checks their Facebook account. This is half the people in that age group. About 71% of adults use Facebook, and let me put that into perspective for you guys. Only 26% of adults use Instagram, and I know you guys are like, oh my god, Instagram is for younger people, so of course adults aren't using it. Well, a lot of adults are using Twitter, and only 23% is using Twitter. So Facebook has become one of the most popular and favorable social media platform to use. Right now, Facebook currently has 1.44 billion users. The second most is WhatsApp, and that app is six years old, and Facebook owns it, so they're just dominant. 
Damn, Daniel. Moving into number seven, since the launch of 2004, Facebook has been one of the fastest growing companies. And because of this, Facebook needs to hire a lot of people to work for them. So Facebook, on its 12th year this year, has over 12,000 employees. That's more than over 9,000! Facebook has also diversified itself, being available in many, many countries in its languages. Right now, they're offered in over 140 different languages. Number six, over 350 million people suffer from Facebook addiction disorder. And yes, this is a real thing. I suffer from it. Let's see if you guys do. Some people, like myself, have to check their phones. Like, they're glued to it. Every second, they have to see if someone posted something new on Facebook. And I'm sure this addiction Mark Zuckerberg wants no cure to. It's so crazy how he created something that, you know, we need it to survive. It's so crazy because if there was a choice, like, here's food. If you don't eat this, you're going to starve. Or here's Facebook, you know, okay, I need Facebook to survive. God, come on, easy answer. So this Facebook addiction is FAD for short, F-A-D. So there are six symptoms to FAD. So let's see if you guys have it. Number one, tolerance. This term is used to describe the desperate behavior of a Facebook addict. Two, withdrawal symptoms. This is if you don't have Facebook, you're going crazy, you're having the shakes. Or if your phone dies, you don't know what to do. You're trying to find out where the closest internet cafe is. Three, reduction of normal social recreational activities. Four, virtual dates. Five, fake friends. Eight out of 10 friends that you have on Facebook, you don't even know who they are. And six, complete addiction. So if you have any of these and they've been apparent for the past six to eight months, you have this addiction. Moving into number five, Facebook employs non-traditional recruiting methods. Back in 2005, Chris Putnam, who was a college student, hacked into Facebook and instead of pursuing legal actions, Facebook actually hired him. Facebook wanted him for his talent. And Facebook is one of these few companies these days that will actually hire any type of person. On the Facebook career page, it states they will not discriminate based upon race, religion, color, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, status as a protected veteran, status as an individual with disabilities. And this list just goes on and on and on. This is one of the reasons why I love Facebook. Number four, we have some interesting statistics for you guys. Every second, there's about 20,000 people on Facebook. By the time I said that, there's probably 100,000. That means in 18 minutes, there's about 11 million people on Facebook. And I know you guys are watching this video and you have your other hand uh, on Facebook right now. On average, there's over 486,000 users a minute accessing Facebook from their phone. Every 15 minutes, there's over 49 million posts. That's 49,433,000, which is about 3 million posts a minute. From interesting facts, I kind of covered a little bit, but let's talk about Facebook paying hackers when they hack their site. So this is a little weird. If you hack into Facebook, they will pay you for it. That is sweet. I'm going to go hack them right now. Okay, I don't, I don't know how to hack anything. So in at number three, Facebook actually wants hackers to try to find weak spots in their system. That way they find how they hack the system so they can put a stronger defense system to avoid that type of hack in the future. I think this is a very smart move by Mark Zuckerberg. In the past two years, he has paid $1 million to 329 hackers for being able to find these holes in Facebook security. There's about 600,000 hacking attempts made every single day and Facebook only had 329 of them in the past few years. I mean, those are pretty good numbers. All right, number two, Facebook loses about $25,000 for every minute the site is down. So again, this is why it's very important to not have people hacking into their site. And also it's important to have a big enough server to have backup so Facebook is always running. I don't remember the last time Facebook's ever been down, but there has been many times in Facebook's history. Finally, we've all made it into number one spot. So far we learned why Facebook is blue. One in five people get divorces because of Facebook. Facebook hires all sorts of people. Facebook also encourages people to hack their site because they get paid for it. Well now in at number one, Mark Zuckerberg is the company's lowest paid employee. Mark Zuckerberg's salary right now and for a very long time has been one dollar. And I know what you guys are thinking. Oh my god Landon, that's totally BS. How is he worth billions of dollars and he's only paying himself one dollar a year? Well he doesn't have to pay himself because he has a lot of stocks in Facebook. He believed in his company at an early stage, he bought a lot of stocks and now they're very valuable. So he's making his billions of dollars from Facebook stocks. And because he pays himself only one dollar as an employee, he doesn't have to pay a lot of taxes. He's probably paying like 10 cents. I don't, I don't even think the government taxes him for that. But you know what, he gets hit big on the corporate level. I mean, if he's bringing in billions, he's spending like 
hundreds of millions, if not a billion in taxes. That's crazy. Starting off at number 10 now, we have people you may know. Many of you guys are familiar with the people you may know feature on Facebook. Facebook will recommend people to you that it thinks you should be friends with. Okay, that sounds fine, right? Facebook says it comes from things like mutual friends, being tagged in the same photo with someone, or networks you both belong to, such as schools, universities, workplaces, that sort of thing. In May 2018 though, Mashable published an article that suggested Facebook may be using shadier tactics with this. The author reported that they had been suggested to be friends with people they have been on dates with in the past, people with whom they had no mutual friends with at all, their co-worker's dad was also suggested, someone they only had one mutual contact with. They were also suggested to be friends with people they had no mutual friends with whatsoever, sometimes even people with incomplete profiles. They inquired about what's going on with Facebook. A spokesperson for the company said that Facebook is always confirming that the help center content is accurate and reflects the most common types of information that inform suggestions. The fact that Facebook said the most common type made people think that they may have other types of data on us, data that you or anyone else may never know at all. What data is this? How exactly do they get it? Either way, I'm sure it's all very credible. Facebook has never done anything strange with people's data. Moving on to number nine now, we have the like button. Here's something that I never knew until I made this video. Have you guys ever been to a page with a Facebook like button? It could be a news site, a gaming site, a forum, whatever it is, I'm sure you know what I mean. You've probably even been on a site like that today. It's supposed to be a quick way for you to like or share the content you're seeing on Facebook with your friends, but it has a pretty creepy underbelly to it. If a site has a Facebook like button, then Facebook knows you've been there, and I mean any site, even sites that you might want to keep hidden from other people. Facebook says, we collect information when you visit or use third party websites and apps that use our services, like when they offer our like button or Facebook login, or use our measurement and advertising services. So, by you guys agreeing to use Facebook and those websites agreeing to include the like button, Facebook can accurately track wherever you've been online. I'm sure that when some people learn that, they start noticing the like button a lot more. Next up at the number eight spot now, we have your profile picture. Did you know that Facebook basically owns your pictures? Many people don't realize that Facebook can legally use your pictures for whatever they want. You might think there's no way this is possible. They're your pictures, right? You either took them or they include you. That sounds like enough for you to own them. Well, apparently not. Apparently the moment you upload a picture, you've agreed to certain terms and conditions. If you don't believe me, let's take a look at the official Facebook terms and conditions that I'm sure we've all read extensively. Try not to mouth the words along with me, no matter how tempting it is. Facebook says, for content that is covered by intellectual property rights, like photos and videos, IP content, you specifically give us the following permission, subject to your privacy and application settings. You grant us a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, worldwide license to use any IP content that you post on or in connection with Facebook IP license. So, there you go. Technically speaking, Facebook can use your picture however they want. They could even slap a 10 story picture of you on the side of a skyscraper. I mean, they're not gonna do that, obviously, so don't worry. Or maybe just worry a little bit. A little bit of worry is good. Next up at number seven now, we have the face map. Did you guys know that Facebook has a map of your face? This is where things start to get really weird in this video. Facebook actually knows who's in your pictures or if you're in someone else's pictures before you've even managed to tag them. Some of you may have already realized this when Facebook suggests who to tag before you've even typed in any names at all. The reason is now clear. Facebook scans and maps faces so that it can recommend tags for pictures. A lot of people may just find this quite a useful feature, but if you think about it, this feature means that Facebook has mapped everyone's face who has ever been tagged in any picture on Facebook. That's a few billion people. Facebook can probably track faces now better than some police departments. Welcome to the future. Next up number six now, we have specific searches. Generally, people use a search bar on Facebook to either search for people and places. It's just the name of a friend or the name of a restaurant, something like that. Most people aren't aware though that you can search for creepily specific things in the search bar. If you want to search for single people in Chicago who like Ed Sheeran, you can do that. Just type that in. Facebook will bring up people who tick all those boxes. These people 
didn't sign up to be listed in this way. They're just single on Facebook. They have set their location to Chicago and they may have hit the like button on an Ed Sheeran fan page like two years ago. Other searches can include searching for married people who attended a certain event, searching for friends in a certain area who had pictures at a certain restaurant. The list goes on. Some people may see this as a helpful feature, others may be deleting their account as I speak. Next up at number 5 now we have Facebook depression. A lot of people have reported that increased Facebook use has a correlation with being depressed, but is that actually true? Well now in fairness there have been studies that have found no link at all, but there have also been some well discussed ones that do. One of those actually came from Harvard. Now they found that real world social networks were a good thing. We're talking about groups, families, friends or networks who have regular contact with other people in the world. Facebook was actually negatively associated with overall well being though. The results were particularly strong for mental health. Most measures of Facebook in one year predicted a decrease in mental health a year later. They found consistently that both liking others content and clicking links significantly predicted a subsequent reduction in self reported physical health, mental health and life satisfaction. Honestly, of all the reasons to give up Facebook on this list, that might be the most compelling one so far for some people. What do you guys think though? Moving on to number 4 now, we have no deleting. We may have touched on this point in previous videos, but this deserves to be talked about now. You can delete anything you want on Facebook, but that doesn't mean Facebook actually deletes it. Deleting a picture on Facebook is more like deleting something on your computer. It just goes to your recycle bin. You have to then go into your recycle bin to actually delete it for good. Recycle bin in, in this analogy is Facebook. In their own words they say this, when you delete IP content it's deleted in a manner similar to emptying the recycle bin on a computer. However, you understand that removed content may persist in backup copies for a reasonable period of time. So. There we have it. They even admit they are like a recycle bin. Of course, just like we've talked about before, this doesn't mean Facebook is just randomly saving people's pictures they delete, but the capability is there. I also find it interesting, personally, that their backup copies remain for a reasonable amount of time. That could be anything, you know, could be a day, a week, or forever. Next up at number three now, we have the right to remove. So by now in the video, we've already established that Facebook can track you, they can keep your deleted content, they can do a lot of things but at least they can't delete the things you don't want them to. Wrong! Facebook reserves the right to remove whatever it wants from your page. Before you freak out too much though, they will tell you that they've done it if they do it. So if you haven't been informed by them, they probably have never done it to you. They also give you the right to appeal, which is good, but when it comes down to actually deleting stuff, they don't need your permission and they don't have to inform you. The Facebook terms and conditions read, we can remove any content or information you post on Facebook if we believe that it violates this statement of our policies. Some people out there say this is totally fine, that Facebook would only use this power to remove something that incites hatred or violence. Others have pointed to examples where they believe Facebook was silencing freedom of speech. This topic really does tend to divide people. Where do you guys stand on it? Moving on to number 2 now, we have selling your face. We talked earlier in the video about how Facebook owns your pictures and reserves the right to use them. Well, this is kind of the next progression from that. Facebook can actually sell sell your pictures on to a third party. When you sign up for Facebook, you give them express permission to use your face in advertising for them or any other company. Again, if we refer to what Facebook says in their own terms and conditions, they say, you give us permission to use your name, profile picture, content and information in connection with commercial, sponsored or related content such as a brand you like, served or enhanced by us. This means for example that you permit a business or other entity to pay us to display your name and or profile picture with your content or information without any compensation to you. I love that last sentence. I like how that last bit is just a bit of salt in the wound there. They can use your face in advertising and you're not going to get a single penny for it. Sorry. Can you imagine how freaky it would be to see your own face on a poster for Facebook or any other company? Maybe it's already happened and we just don't know about it. And finally number one now we have the Facebook bot. Okay this isn't quite the same level as the Terminator but it freaked out a lot of people when 
when it happened. In 2017, Facebook was forced to shut down a pair of chatbots they had created when they discovered that the bots had created a secret language of their own. The algorithms behind the bots were created by Facebook's AI research lab as a way to improve the conversations that their chatbots were having with humans. However, in their effort to boost the bots ability to negotiate and speak to humans, the bots ended up realizing that normal human language was actually inefficient for them. As they talked to each other, they started saying gibberish sentences like I can, can, I, I, everything else. Another time one of them said balls have zero to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. To me, I started to creep myself out a bit there. The point is, they were talking to themselves in a new language that people at Facebook didn't understand. They still aren't even sure what some of the phrases actually meant. The company pulled the plug on the whole thing, but some people worry that they just went deeper with the experiments and eventually they may end up accidentally creating Skynet. Oh, look, we've come full circle with the Terminator reference. Starting off at number 10 now, we have Cambridge Analytica. This is perhaps one of the most famous Facebook scandals in recent years. In June 20 2014, a researcher named Alexander Kogan developed a personality quiz app for Facebook. 270,000 users were asked if the app could access their data and less known, the data of their friends. Because of this, from the small pool of people, Kogan was able to gain access to the data of up to 87 million Facebook profiles. He then sold that data to Cambridge Analytica, a voter profiling company. They used that to make 30 million so-called psychographic profiles about voters. It was eventually revealed that the company had used their information to influence things like the US election, the Brexit referendum and a number of other big political events over the past few years. When the spotlight turned to Facebook, they said the users consented to give the app their data, but this wasn't good enough for many people who felt Facebook could no longer be trusted with their information. Moving on to number 9 now, we have reading messages. In the wake of the aforementioned Cambridge Analytica scandal, many people started downloading their Facebook data to see what exactly Facebook had stored on them. Many people expected pictures, status updates, perhaps a list of their friends. However, they found a lot more than that and people started sharing their discoveries on Twitter. One user found that Facebook had recorded the data of every call he'd ever made, including the time and duration, as well as data about every last text message I've received or sent. Actress Emma Kennedy tweeted that her data revealed Facebook had recorded every phone number in her contacts, every social event she ever went to, a list of her friends' birthdays, and a list of every text she'd ever sent. Facebook responded by saying they take nothing that the user doesn't agree to at some point or another. Do you guys think it's the fault of the user or are Facebook overstepping a boundary? Next up at number 8 now we have divorce. Did you know Facebook is said to cause divorce? According to a 2009 survey in the UK, around 20% of divorce petitions included some kind of reference to Facebook. It thought that Facebook was causing people in marriages to worry about their spouses, contacts and relations with other people on the site. Researchers claim that high levels of Facebook usage can cause in Facebook related conflicts which lead to breakups and even divorce. Facebook jealousy, partner surveillance, ambiguous information and online portrayals of intimate relationships are just some of the facets of this phenomenon. Quite often partners on one side of the divorce report feeling neglected and having low feelings of passion and intimacy in the relationship. Have you guys ever been involved in or witnessed a relationship breakdown due to Facebook? Next up on number 7 now we have Facebook stalking. It's an elephant in the room when it comes to using Facebook. The more you put out there, the more likely it is that someone with a little bit too much interest in you can stalk you and make your life uncomfortable or even hell. According to the National Center for Victims of Crime, over 1 million women and 370,000 men are stalked annually in the US alone. 63% of Facebook profiles are visible to the public, but it's teens that are most at risk. 3 out of 10 teens in the US have been stalked by a complete complete stranger on Facebook at some point and received numerous friend requests from people they don't even know. Perhaps more worrying though is that 7 in 10 victims actually know their offender in some ways. In the years since its creation, Facebook has taken extra measures to ensure its users safety when it comes to stalking, but it's still brought up in many conversations. Next up at number 6 now we have addiction. You may be surprised to hear that Facebook is said to be as addictive as alcohol or smoking. A 2011 study found that some users found quitting 
social networking sites such as Facebook to be comparable to quitting smoking or giving up alcohol. Now you may think Facebook denies this, but they kind of admitted it, at least Sean Parker did. He's the billionaire early Facebook investor who has claimed Mark Zuckerberg knowingly made Facebook as addictive as possible. He said in the early days, Facebook's entire goal was to consume as much of your time as possible. If you'd like an anecdotal story about how addictive Facebook can be, how's this? In 2014, it was reported that the site went down for about 30 minutes, which prompted several users to call the police due to severe withdrawal symptoms crazy. Moving on to number 5 now, we have minimum age. Facebook sets the minimum age to use its site at 13. However, many young people have reported having their Facebook accounts well before reaching that age. A 2011 study by First Monday examined how parents consistently enable children as young as 10 to sign up for accounts. The study involved over 1,000 households and found that 76% of parents reported their child joined Facebook when they were younger than 13. The study also claimed that Facebook removed roughly 20,000 users each day for violating its minimum age policy. Now, Of course, this is to do with internet laws as well, but many criticize Facebook for not making it clear enough to parents that Facebook has a minimum age. 47% of parents said they were unaware Facebook had ever set a minimum age at all. Next up at number 4 now, we have the greater good. Many people were outraged after a 2016 Facebook memo got leaked, revealing a dark side to the company. The memo, published by BuzzFeed, was written by a Facebook vice president. President Andrew Bosworth. In it, he argued that Facebook's growth is more important than any safety concerns. One specific quote seemed to disturb people more than all others. Bosworth said, Maybe someone dies in a terrorist attack coordinated on our tools, and still we connect people. The ugly truth is that we believe in connecting people so deeply that anything that allows us to connect people more often is de facto good. Of course, Bosworth claiming that terrorists using Facebook to help them kill innocent innocent people is still a good thing, did not go down well with the public. He admitted writing the memo, but said he didn't necessarily agree with it. He only wanted to start a conversation about the topic. Most people didn't buy that though, and Facebook made the news in all the wrong ways. We have cookies. In November 2011, an article published by USA Today claimed that Facebook had been creating logs of pages visited by its users, and also non-users. The use of tracking cookies is nothing new. Many websites ask your permission to use them so they can see your browsing habits. You're usually given the chance to say no, but in this case, Facebook was using cookies to track people who were never even on their site at all. Of course, this caused a lot of outrage. It's one thing Facebook doing things with the data of its own users if they agree to it. It's another thing doing it to users who may have never visited the site ever. A number of governments took moves to stop this. One example came in November 2015. The Belgian Privacy Commissioner ordered Facebook to cease tracking non-users or Facebook fines of $330,000 a day. Facebook claimed this practice actually made users safer, but they were eventually forced to stop. This is the reason why you now have to log into Facebook to see publicly available content. Next up at number 2 now, we have Envy. Facebook has been accused of causing a massive spike in envious people and the unhappiness that accompanies that. This phenomenon is not exclusive to Facebook, and I'm sure you are all aware of it. Facebook shows people their friends often living successful and positive lives, while they are often highly representative. Basically, it's all just a front. We all know this about social media, but still, it's something that many of us just kind of slip into. Envy, jealousy, even if we know it's not real. This is obviously down to the fact that most people don't share negative aspects of their lives on Facebook, only positive ones. Another reason is that because Facebook is open to everyone, it exposes inequality between social groups, showing the have-nots what the haves have. I guess, if that makes sense. All of this can lead people to severe depression, self-loathing, rage, and feelings of inferiority. Is this just part of the Facebook game? Is it human nature, or a technique Facebook uses to keep you hooked? And finally, number one now, we have fake news. It's a phrase that didn't even exist a few years ago. Now everyone knows it, and many say it's thanks to Facebook. After the 2016 US presidential election, it came under heavy fire with people claiming it didn't do enough to stop the spread of fake news stories on their site. Some even went as far as to say Donald Trump would not have won if the fake stories that helped his agenda were not so widespread. Now, Many of you guys may be young or tech savvy enough to know a fake news story when you see one, but many older generations who use Facebook grew up in a time when news stories were 
arguably a lot more credible, at least the main sources of news were. These days more than 40% of Americans say they get their news from Facebook, with titles such as Pope Francis endorses Donald Trump or Obama admits he was born in Kenya, it's no wonder that people are concerned. These stories were shared by millions of people without a single shred of evidence to back them up. The people behind these fake articles are motivated by quick cash through the adverts on Facebook. That's not inherently Facebook's fault, but they have since admitted they could do more to curb the spreading of fake news on their site. Whether they like it or not, this little website made in a college dorm back in 2004 now has the power to sway global politics and it's learning to take the responsibility that comes with that. Thank you.